Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our service. We are so glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're a part of what God is going to do today. Now, um, the good news is my voice is back. The last couple of weeks, we kind of uh, didn't have as best a service as we, we could have had, but uh, my throat was kind of sore, and we didn't get to sing as much as we wanted to, and I didn't preach as much as I wanted to. I didn't get as loud as I wanted to. But praise the Lord, I, I thank you that uh, you bared with us and, and got through it. And now I'm back and uh, we're ready to preach. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, announcements. Check out our YouTube channel. We put up a lot of videos this past week. In fact, we put up one video every day for the past two weeks. Now, I can't promise that's going to be kept up, but we're going to, whenever I can do a video, I'll upload it and, and we'll take it from there. But... Um, what I'm starting now is a little bit of a series and on what we believe. And I actually take the online Bible Church, our Articles of Faith, and over ten sessions I'm going to talk about each one of those articles. And there's ten of them there, so it's going to take ten days to get through it. But I think that you'll find that what we believe here at Online Bible Church is pretty, pretty mainstream, pretty, pretty uh, typical of what you'll find in, in conservative, Bible-believing, fundamental churches. Um, you won't see anything too outlandish or anything too um, obscure or anything like that. And what we believe is pretty well standard amongst all uh, King James Bible-believing churches. And so if you're interested in what we believe and why we believe it, Check out our YouTube channel. I started yesterday, uh, and I put up a video on what we believe about God. And now, I considered doing an all-in-one session and doing all of it, but I thought, you know what, it's going to get kind of long and a little confusing, so I'd rather just break it down. And uh, so the videos are generally short. They're usually under five minutes. And so I really encourage you, over the next ten days or next ten uh, videos... And check out those videos and find out why we believe what we believe. And I actually read word for word from our Articles of Faith, and I explain a little bit behind it of why we believe it. Um, also, our Bible study, don't forget, Wednesday nights, our Bible studies are uploaded by 6 p.m. And uh, they are put on YouTube and then shared to our Facebook page. And so, uh, please check that out. We're in Romans chapter 14. So we're almost done the book of Romans. We've only got two and a half chapters left. And then I'm not sure. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians, but I'm not sure if we're going to take a little break before we get there. I haven't decided yet. But anyway, um, probably just a few more weeks left in uh, Romans. We might even be finished Romans by Christmas or early on in the new year. And so... Uh, please check that out. I pray that that's a blessing to you. So, um, those are our announcements. Um, we're going to get into worshiping the Lord uh, this afternoon. And I have a song that I've listened to for a number of years, but we've never actually sung it here before. And I'm hoping, now that my voice is back, we're able to sing it and we're able to praise the Lord. Um, this is a fast song, and it might be a little difficult because I've never sung it before. But anyway, we've sung the chorus of it before, but we've never sung the whole song. And it's called, In the New Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. When the toils of life are over and we lay our armor down, and we bid farewell to earth with all its cares, we shall meet and greet our loved ones, and our Christ we then shall crown in the new Jerusalem. They'll be singing, they'll be shouting when the saints come marching home in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. Waving palms with loud hosannas as the king shall take his throne in the new Jerusalem. Though the way is sometimes lonely, we will hold me with his hand. Through the testings and the trials, I must go. But I'll trust and gladly follow, for some time I'll understand. In the new Jerusalem. Well, they'll be singing, they'll be shouting, when the saints come marching home. In Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. 
waving palms with loud hosannas as the king shall take his throne in the new Jerusalem. When the last goodbye is spoken and the tears stain wiped away, and our eyes shall catch a glimpse of glory fair, then with bounding hearts we'll see him who hath washed our sins away in the new Jerusalem. They'll be singing, they'll be shouting when the saints come marching home in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. Waving palms with loud hosannas as the king shall take his throne in the new Jerusalem. When we join the ransomed army in the summer land above, and the face of our dear Savior we behold, we will sing and shout forever, and will grow in perfect love in the new Jerusalem. They'll be singing, they'll be shouting when the saints come marching home in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. Waving palms with loud hosannas as the king shall take his throne in the new Jerusalem. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's a good song. It's hard to sing. It's hard to catch your breath when you're singing because it's so fast. And, and uh, <laughs> But anyway, praise the Lord. I'd like to sing uh, one more hymn, if we could. And this is the hymn that we sung last week, and I think that I didn't really do it justice because my voice was pretty sore and, and uh, wasn't the greatest of singing. And so um, we're going to do it again, and hopefully this will go a lot better. It's called Little Is Much When God Is In It. Praise the Lord. In the harvest field now ripened, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it, and he'll not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended, and our race on earth is run, He will say, if we are faithful, welcome home. My child, well done. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Amen. I love that song. I'm going to add that into our collection of songs at the front of my Bible that we rotate through and sing. Praise the Lord. So we're going to pray this afternoon, and we're going to pray that God's going to be in this service, and God's going to bless this service, and God's going to bless you that are watching. 
this service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful once again for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to be able to gather together here on the internet and have service. What a wonderful, wonderful thing that is, Lord. And what a wonderful use of the technology that's available today that allows us to be able to do that. I pray, God, that you will be in this service. I pray, Lord, that the, the hymns that we sung unto you, Lord, were, were wonderful and a, and a wonderful sound to your ear, Lord. I pray that you will accept our praise and our worship. I also want to pray, Lord, that as we continue on in this service and the, the message that I've prepared, Lord, with your help, I pray, God, that you've uh, given me a voice to be able to preach it again, and I'm just so thankful, Lord, that you were able to bring me through um, that cold that I had and that sore throat, Lord, and that I'm back, and, and I'm able to proclaim your truth with all of the strength that is within me, Lord. And I just want to pray, God, that this message that I preach, Lord, I pray, God, that somebody will hear it that needs to hear it, Lord. I pray that it will not fall to the ground void, Lord, but I pray, God, that somebody that needs to hear it will hear this message somehow, Lord. That as we present this truth out onto the Internet that would be available to just about anyone in the world who wants to look it up, I pray, God, that somebody will hear this that needs to hear it, Lord. I pray, God, that you'll be in the remainder of this service that the word that I preach, Lord, will not be my word, but will be your word. Father, we pray and we ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I have to say right off the bat that um, normally we try to keep our services about 35 to 40 minutes. Well, I don't have a watch right now. So I have no idea how long this service is going to be. I have no way of judging when it's time to close. I have no idea of judging when it's time that we keep going because it's not yet time to close. I'm just going to preach today until I feel I've preached enough. And uh, I'm really going to um, trust in the Lord to lead me to that Lord. And so um, I don't know how long this service is going to be. It might be a little longer. It might be a little shorter. I don't know, but I'm just going to trust the Lord. And so we're going to talk today a little bit about lifting the veil. Lifting the veil. There's a veil in the world today. Especially there was a veil in the Old Testament. We're going to look at that today. And we're going to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 13 to 18. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. And not as Moses which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with an open face, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. There's a lot of talking about the veil. And in particular, Moses is mentioned here. Now, Moses, you can say, is a type of Christ. Moses is like an image of Christ. Moses isn't Christ, we know that. But if you look at the Old Testament through the light of the New Testament, you will see Jesus Christ there all over the place. In my daily uh, reading, I've made it up to Exodus and... Um, in Exodus, after the children of Israel were left, or uh, Moses led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt, and they were in the wilderness, what did they do? They built a church. They built a tabernacle to worship the Lord. And, and so, if you look at the tabernacle, and I, I remember doing some studies many, many years ago on the tabernacle and how it's all a type of Christ. Everything in that tabernacle is a type and a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. And so, when we look at the Old Testament, and we read the Old Testament, we know that there's a veil there. 
is a veil. Now, in this passage here that we read, Paul mentions Moses. He mentions him by name, and we're going to go back to verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of which is abolished, but in but their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away by the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. If you've been following our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study at all, and I hope you have been, we are in the book of Romans. Now, we just passed a couple of chapters ago um, quite a lengthy chunk of Romans that talks a lot about the Jews. And you'll notice that the Jews are blinded. So this passage is speaking primarily of the Jews, but there's also an application to Christians in the church age that we don't understand the old covenant being away with and the new covenant coming into effect at the cross. So in verse 13, when Moses is being mentioned, it's talking about that Old Testament. It's talking about that old covenant. Those Jews, that they didn't know Jesus wasn't revealed. Jesus wasn't alive yet. They didn't understand. He was still veiled. But if you look towards the end of the Old Testament, and you look at the prophets, the prophecies in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, you'll see that's all talking about Jesus. And it was written 700 years before Jesus was even born. So there was a Messiah. They were expecting a Messiah. The Jewish nation was expecting a Messiah. They were watching, they were waiting. The, the prophets had spoke about it. Isaiah had spoken about it. Ezekiel had spoken about it. They knew of it. They were waiting for it. And Jesus Christ came to earth. He came to earth. He said he was the Messiah. He claimed to be the Son of God. Not only that, but he performed miracles. He performed healings. There were wonders. There were signs. There were all kinds of things that were happening. But not very many Jewish people believed that he was the Messiah. Why is that? Because of the veil. Because of the veil. They were blinded. And they were behind a veil. Now when we think about a veil, we think about whatever is behind that veil being obscured. We know there's something there, but we don't know what it is. We can't see it with clarity. It's obscured. But my friend, I want to talk today about that veil being lifted. That veil has been lifted. Let's keep looking at this. Verse 15, but even unto this day, when Paul was writing this book to the church in Corinth, there were still people that were blinded about Christ. When Paul says, even unto this day, and not only back in Paul's day, but even today in 2021, there's still people that that veil has never been lifted. There are still people that are so blinded. There's still people that are, their hearts are blinded. Their minds are blinded. Have you ever been around somebody who's blind? Not physically, but spiritually. Have you ever been around somebody like that? Have you ever tried to share the gospel and talk theology and talk about God with somebody who's spiritually blind? If you want to see what a blind spirit looks like. If you want to see eyes that are blind, if you want to see a heart that is blind, look at Romans chapter 1. I preached a couple weeks ago on the seven steps to hell. If you haven't watched that message, watch that message. Because I show you the steady decline of society. People, not just people, but society in general. How it declines and falls into hell because of spiritual blindness. Because of that veil, that veil that can't be lifted, that could be ripped apart, has never, ever been removed. Even unto this day, even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Jewish people. 
He's talking about the Jewish people. Verse 16, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And so here it is right here in black and white, how that veil is removed. When you're born, you're born with a veil on your mind and on your heart. You're, you're, you're blind. Now how can your eyes see? How can that veil be removed? When it shall turn to the Lord. When it shall turn to the Lord. Then the veil shall be taken away. If you want to know how that to get rid of that veil. If you want to know how to lift that veil. If you want to know how to rip that veil apart. You need to turn to the Lord. You need to trust in the gospel. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. When you turn to that, and you trust in that, and you believe in that, your eyes, your spiritual eyes will be opened. That heart of stone will be turned into a heart of flesh. I love that Old Testament passage. Heart of stone into a heart of flesh. How does it happen? By trusting in the Lord. By turning to God. By getting right with God. By trusting in the gospel. That's how that veil gets removed. You see, there's a veil between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is what I've been talking about. There's a veil. Those Jews are still blind. Those Jews are still behind that veil. That veil's never been lifted. Because they never turned to Christ. Let's turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27, and I want to read verses 50 to 53. This is a passage that talks about when Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross. Verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Means he died. At that moment he died. Now thankfully he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay in the grave. He resurrected, thankfully. But what happened at that time? Verse 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. What does that mean? That veil in the temple. You see, in the tabernacle, the old tabernacle in the wilderness, in the book of Exodus, you'll see that the Holy of Holies was hidden behind a veil. It was hidden behind a curtain. They couldn't even get in there. They couldn't even see it. But what happened at that moment when Christ died? That veil was torn apart. It was rent in twain. It was ripped in two from the top right down to the bottom. That is the veil between the Old and the New Testament. You see, we tend to think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We tend to think of that as New Testament, don't we? Because it is in the New Testament part of our Bible. But really, the old, the old Testament is not finished, and the New Testament doesn't begin until Christ dies. So when you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before Jesus died in those books, you're still reading Old Testament doctrine. I've been in some churches, and that's all they preach is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They never, ever preach Paul. They never, ever preach any of the New Testament except for the Gospels. They only preach what Jesus said. Well, there's a problem with that. I mean... Jesus had a lot of good things to say. He was God manifested in flesh. Of course he had a lot of good things to say. But the stuff that he was preaching, the stuff that he was teaching, was for the millennial kingdom. See, we're not in the millennial kingdom yet. Remember, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's not talking about the church age. That's talking about the millennial kingdom, that we're not even there yet. We're not even in that time yet. That doesn't happen until after the rapture, after the tribulation, after Armageddon, the millennial kingdom. Jesus returns at Armageddon and sets up his millennial kingdom. And so we can't build doctrines from things out of the Old Testament. It has to come from the New Testament. Study to show thyself a proven unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to know how to rightly divide. That's for us today. That's not for us today. 
Now, I'm not discouraging you from reading your entire Bible. Please do read your entire Bible. You can learn a lot from the Old Testament. You can learn about a lot about who God is from the Old Testament. You can learn a lot about what sin is from the Old Testament. But if you're trying to build a doctrine on things from the Old Testament, you're going to fall short and you're going to have trouble dispensationally because it's not for you today. Because back when that was written, there was still that veil. There was still that obscurity. And now, the veil's been removed. Let's read this passage again. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. What happens in verse 52? Let's look. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of their graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Here we have a resurrection. We have a resurrection of people that have died. Now where have we heard this before? Oh yeah, the, the rapture. The rapture. The dead in Christ will rise first. Those people that are dead, those people, those spiritual people, those people that were saved, those wonderful dear brothers and sisters in Christ that have passed away and they're in the grave. They're only sleeping, my friend. When the rapture comes and that trump of God sounds, those dead people are going to come up out of their grave and they're going to resurrect bodily into heaven. And then we which are alive and remain will meet them in the air. So this isn't the first time that happened. This isn't the first time people have come up out of their graves. You know, when Jesus Christ died, those Old Testament people that were in Abraham's bosom, that was opened up. That was opened up. And those people that died under the law, they went to heaven. You see, back in the Old Testament, you couldn't go right to heaven. You went to paradise, you went to Abraham's bosom. Just in the heart of the earth. Because you couldn't get to heaven because the blood of Christ hadn't been shed yet. So there was no gospel. There was nothing to put your trust and your faith in. If you sinned, you had to, to sacrifice an animal. And the blood of that innocent animal was shed to cover your sins. But we don't need to do that today because our sins are covered by the blood of the Lamb of Calvary. Jesus Christ's own blood was shed for us because the veil has been removed. So we've talked about the veil. We've talked about the veil between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We've talked about the veil that exists on some people's hearts and on some people's minds. But did you know there's also going to be another veil that's going to be lifted in the future? Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to close with this because I have no idea, I have no idea how long I've been preaching because I don't have a watch on. So I'm just going to trust that this is about the right time to close. One more passage I just want to look at in closing. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 12 to 13. 1 Corinthians uh, 13, verses 12 to 13. For now, right now, the church age, right now, we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face. For I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Let's go back to verse 12 and see what it's talking about here. But now. When Paul says, but now, he's talking about the dispensation of the church age. And that's where we are right now. Dispensationally, we are in the church age. So now, we see through a glass darkly. There's a veil. There's some obscurity. We can't see with all clarity, the glory of Jesus Christ. You see, everything that we know about God, everything that we know about heaven, everything that we know about Jesus Christ is revealed to us in the Bible. And the Bible doesn't tell us everything. There's still a lot of 
of things that are obscure. There's still a lot of things that are hidden. Now, everything that God wants us to know is here. This is the complete, the complete Word of God. Everything that God wants us to know is contained in His Word. But you know what? There's going to come a time when we're going to become face to face with the glory of Jesus Christ. For now we see in a glass darkly. For now we see it through the Bible. For now there's a bit of a veil there and we can't quite see with all clarity. For now it's a little obscured. But then face to face. We're going to come face to face with Jesus Christ someday. Now we cannot do it in our natural bodies. If Jesus Christ were to appear to us today, His glory would be so overwhelming it would probably kill us physically. Really. But when we're in our glorified body, after the rapture, after we've gone on in glory, we're going to be able to see Jesus Christ in the fullness of His glory. We will see in our glorified body, we will see Christ face to face in all of His glory. All of those mysteries that we don't know about now are going to be revealed. We can't really comprehend the Godhead. We can't really figure it out. The best we can come up with is, is the Trinity. And, and the best way to describe the, twin, the Trinity is one God made up of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We know that. We believe that's taught in Scripture. We believe the Trinity, although the word Trinity is not in the Bible, the doctrine, the, the, the teaching of the Trinity is clearly there. And we can't comprehend it. I cannot understand how God can be one and three at the same time. And can anybody? Can anybody understand that? Can anybody understand all the glory of God? Can, everybody, can anybody understand how God is so powerful that He is able to speak and behold there is a universe? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form of light. And God said, let there be. And there was. I'm sorry, I don't understand that. I can't comprehend uh, eternal power. I can't understand it. I can't comprehend it. I can't understand how God can be so powerful that he can just speak and everything, every molecule, every atom obeys his command and forms a universe. I, I can't understand that. I, we can't understand the universe. How far does the universe go? It's, it's, it's eternal as far as we can tell. How can a God create something eternal? He has to be eternal himself. I can't comprehend that. I can't comprehend eternity. I'm a finite mortal being. I cannot comprehend a time when there is no time. That does not make sense to me. Now, I believe it by faith. But someday these mysteries are going to be revealed. Someday we're going to be able to understand God's omnipotence and omnipresence. We're going to be able to understand it. God's going to say, you want to know how I created the universe? I bet you the first day when we get to heaven, God's going to say, okay, everybody, come on in, come on over here. You guys have been wondering all your lies about how I created the universe? This is how I did it. Watch this. Poof. I believe when we get to heaven, there's going to be no more mysteries. Everything's going to be revealed to us. We're, we're, we're going to be able to understand everything because we're going to be in our glorified body. We're not going to be in our mortal body. And so every veil that exists is going to be lifted. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Why? We ask that a lot. Why? Why did God do this? Why doesn't God do this? And we wonder. And we wonder. But yet someday I know and I believe that when we get to heaven, God's going to say, you, you were wondering how I did that? This is how I did that. You were wondering about the Trinity and, and the Godhead and how God is three in one? Here, this is how God is three in one. And we're going to understand it. 
Because we can't understand it right now in our physical bodies. But in our glorified bodies, when we get to heaven, all of that's going to be revealed. We're going to see Christ in all of His glory. Now we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face. I have no idea what time it is, so we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful once again for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to be able to gather together electronically here on the internet and be able to worship you and be able to study your word, Lord. I thank you, God, that you brought me through this sore throat and this cold and, and that I'm, I'm back and feeling better and, and able to preach your word with, with all the might that's in my body. I just want to thank you, Lord, for your word. I want to thank you for what you have revealed to us in your word, but I just can't help but to wonder what it's going to be like when we pass into eternity in our glorified bodies and we get to see everything. We get to see you in all your glory. We get to see all these things that we can only think about and we can't even explain today that someday that's going to all be revealed to us. I thank you, Lord, that you lifted that veil between the Old and the New Testaments. I thank you once again for Jesus Christ who died on our behalf, Lord. And I thank you for that blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. And I thank you, Lord, for your grace. I thank you, Lord, for my faith. I thank you for salvation. And I just want to pray, Lord, that this message that I preached, Lord, will fall on somebody that needs to hear it. Somebody that needs this encouragement. Somebody that's been spending so much time wondering why and why not will somehow be encouraged to know. Just have faith because it's all going to be uh, seen and understood in eternity. Lord, I just pray, God, that you'll be with us this week, with each one of us, God, as we go about our week. I pray, Lord, that you'll bring us all back again next week, Lord, to worship you and hear another message from you, Lord. We pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. So until next time, God bless you. Please check out our, our YouTube channel. We put up a lot of videos. Um, have a look at some of those if you're interested in why we believe what we believe. I started a series yesterday. We started with God. Um, tomorrow I'm going to upload on uh, the Bible and, and different things um, that we believe in our articles of faith. And so if you're new to the faith, check that out. If you're old in the faith and need a reminder of why do we believe certain things, have a look at that. Don't forget Bible study Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. Uh, Romans chapter 14, we're continuing. And so until next time, God bless.